Hello. Hey, Simon. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Simon. It's Skyler. Hey, Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello, Simon. What's up, Simon? Hello. Simon. How you doing? Hey. Hello. Hey, Hello. Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello, Simon. This is Conversations with Storytellers, a podcast of wisdom, thoughts, and folk and fairy tales from our elders, and I am your host, Simon Brooks. A meeting with professional storytellers. I decided to travel around the country when I could to interview some of the elders in the community of traditional storytelling. People who, for their work, travel about telling myths and legends, folk and fairy tales. Each storyteller shares their thoughts on our profession and gems of wisdom and, sometimes, a story or two. I'm glad you're here. If you didn't listen to part one of this interview, please go back and check it out. I ended the first part of the interview with a cliffhanger and you'll have no idea what Joel is talking about. It's worth it. Joel Ben Izzy is a delight. He comes from out west in California. His stories, and there are quite a few, are filled with warmth and passion. In this second part of the interview, he shares even more stories and his process, if he has one. Welcome back, Joel. And when he looked in a puddle of water, he saw his face, which was not the Solomon he knew. It was an old man. And so began the wanderings of Solomon as a beggar, a journey that would last a lifetime. So at some point in telling the beginning of that story, I got really into it, and I didn't know why. But now back to the story at hand. It was not until I found I had thyroid cancer, which I thought would make just a terrific story when I told it, because there was a needle that was this big, right? And they're like, like, why would somebody use a needle that big to test the thyroid? And and it had begun with gout. There was a, it was just this odd mix of things that I thought I, I said, Tolly, to my wife, this is going to make the best story. Look, there's there's the gout, there's the needle, there's a dream about lifting a piano up, dropping on my foot because I that, that was the gout. All these pieces. She said, Joel, this is cancer. I said, No, this will make a great story. And then when I woke up, I had that feeling just for an instant of jet lag. You know that feeling like you wake up and you think, where am I? And what the, and, and I thought, oh, am I in, in Kathmandu maybe? That would be great. Or Budapest? Or maybe, maybe I'm in Paris. I love Paris. And then I heard the beeping of machines and then I was, you know, in surgery or, or not just after surgery. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And it was no adventure at all. And I said, some adventure this is. And there was that weird thing of no sound coming out of my mouth. And I tried again. I said, some adventure this is. And I thought, oh crap, I must be dreaming. Because when you're a performer, you have certain kinds of dreams. Either A, you're like on stage and forgot to get dressed, which can be kind of embarrassing, or B, yeah. You're a storyteller, you get up and you can't speak. I thought, oh, this is one of those dreams. Like, I can't speak. And I waited for it to end. And a couple hours later, as the sun rose outside the hospital window, I said, oh, I'm fully awake and I cannot speak. And at first, the doctors assured me it was temporary. He said, give it a couple of weeks. And after a couple of weeks later, I said, doctor, it's been two weeks. I still can't talk. All I had was a whisper. He said, I wouldn't worry. Give it, a, give it a month. And after a month, they said, Doctor, now it's been a month. I still can't talk. He said, I'd give it two months. And after two months, I said, Doctor, now it's two months. I still can't talk. What? What do I do? He said, if it's two months, this is permanent. You won't be able to speak again. I, I hope this doesn't affect your work. Oh, and so that started me off on a, on a journey. <sighs> and so... so it's a, one of those cases, like you mentioned, of a story that's there. But until you fall into it, suddenly I got very interested in the lesson Solomon could learn only because he lost that ring. And having lost my voice, which was really, you know, I, I that, that linchpin of an identity to, for me, that was really how a, a journey begins for me yeah but I, yeah. I yeah and, and and now you can talk again how long were you were you without your voice a year and a half 
Wow. So you must have been petrified <laughs> through some I, of that I was time. Petrified, and I was really angry, and I was self pitying, and I was bitter. And you know, it's, it's, I was just working with a group in Mexico last week. And I sort of just started questioning. I said, because they'd all traveled to this this place where it's a sort of a health and healing resort. And I said, um, I said, hey, what's the difference between a schlep and a journey? And and if, because some knew the word schlep, some didn't. You know, schlep is sort of like you got kids and you say, all right, at three o'clock we got to be at school, but we have to drop this off here. And then I have to run across town to take them to this lesson. Then I have to do that. And I, I and then and then this is due. So this has to happen. And you, you have this list of 50 things and you're schlepping from one to another. That's a schlep. Okay. Something turns a schlep into a journey. I'll ask you, Simon, what is it? What what turns a schlep into a journey? The the way you view it. Whether you look at it as a list of things to do or a list of experiences to to experience <laughs> like you went on a college trip with your your son last week yeah daughter yeah you yeah, go with your daughter yeah. was it a schlep or a journey it started off as a bit of a schlep and then it turned into a journey yeah yeah so that they're in that that's how this was too this started off as kind of a schlep because i thought my voice would come back at any minute i thought the nerve would come back so i kept on opening up to see talking no no maybe now maybe now and you know i had that that whisper but there's a way of actually showing up in the moment with the reality of it and saying actually this is this is the truth of this moment is all that exists and now this right. moment i mean there's something about the about mindfulness and being present when you feel like you arrive and i i found myself with fall falling into that into that that journey yeah and your voice came back if if i remember right rightly um i've you know i got covid back in august and my memory right. is is still a little dodgy at times but if i remember rightly was it was it a, a some sort of party or bar mitzvah or something when your voice came back uh no no that was a party and a bar mitzvah where i hoped my voice would come back and it did not okay and you're referring to to the scene in my book that that yeah. led to that led to sort of meeting up with lenny who i you right. you want to hear hear what what that's about but yeah so is, is lenny a real person for for realsies or is he for, or is he for some realsies sort of... because i i wanted to tell you the truth lenny is a composite character okay and he's put together from several different people and more so he's a little bit, you know, I, I went through this, this experience and I did have a therapist who said, this is the best thing that's ever happened to you, losing your voice. Wow. To which I said, bullshit. <laughs> and that there, and I, I didn't want to write about my therapist per se as that, as that character. And so I took a little bit of him. I took a little bit of Steve Sandfield too, with that that sort of the the which kind Gruff. of added the gruffness a little bit. I took a little bit of my father's sense of humor, and then I guess I distilled story into a character. Yes, like I like I said, you know, my my youth and childhood was spent with a hunger for stories. You know, when I took on when I took on my name, Joel Ben Izzy, Izzy was my grandfather who had who who it's not like he told me stories. I met him three times in my life and I remember only one meeting with him. You know, because he died by the time I was seven and I probably saw him when I was two and three and five. I remember sitting with him in Cleveland trying to teach him to count. You know, he was a successful businessman. He ran the ideal betting company, mattress store. 
but I was really trying to teach him one, two, three, four, five. And he said, one, three, two, five, four. Yeah? I said, no, no. That's all I that's all I remember of him. But when I wanted a storytelling name, mm-hmm. I took on the name um, Joel, son of Izzy. Ben in Hebrew is son of, and Izzy is a, you know, is a fun name, Isidore Shapiro. And he was evidently quite a storyteller, but it was the hunger of stories. So I took this hunger for stories and desire for stories, and I think I compressed that to make Lenny, this storytelling trickster character, and travel into that world. Yeah, there's there's a there's a little bit of Hunter Thompson in there as well. Like this, yeah, this, yeah, and and um, not not Jack Kerouac, but uh, Raymond Chandler, mm-hmm. right? The, the alcoholic side of it. Yeah, and you know, it was it, it was a fascinating for me. It was a fascinating character, and I was like, it would be so cool if Lenny was real. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I, and you had written, you said, yeah, I want to know more about your mentor, Lenny. I thought, oh, crap, I'm going to have to level with Simon here. And he's... But that's really good, though. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a skill set to that, to be able to take all those different characters and make a brand new character and make it so real. Right. right? I mean, that's, that's the, the strength of that, because you do, you, you do think that this person is real, because, you know... Lenny has all of the the hubris that a human being would have, mm-hmm. the frail one that has had a lot of life experience and that can share that with you, but also that dark side of like, you know, he's had a little bit too much experience and he, you know, and there's, there's a little bit of regret in there. Or that's how it was for me when I was reading the book. Anyway. No, that that's exactly it. He's he's bitter, and you know, this idea of like. You're thinking, oh, if only he really was a true character. But think about how when someone comes to you in a story and you tell, you know, you're telling a story of, a, of I don't know, Gilgamesh or one of the yeah. stories you're telling in your book. And the kids say, oh, is that a true story? You it's don't. True. It's, you, yes, you, it's true in my heart and my mind as it is in yours. <laughs> yes, that's right. I mean, uh, storytellers, we, <laughs> we, we, because we don't want to say, no, no, it's a lie. Right. You know, that, that's, that's it. And, and I, I become after hanging out with Martin just for a little bit. Um, I become very almost rabid when somebody calls something a myth, like to mean a lie, like that's a myth, meaning that yeah. that's a lie. You know, no, there's there's something truer than true about about those things. Yeah, even things like you know Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. That's true. That's, that's yeah, right. There's so much truth in those stories. Yeah. You know, there's, and and oddly in my in my book because it's it's a memoir, mm-hmm. um, and memoirs get into trouble when they say things are true that aren't strictly true. I actually do sort of a disclaimer by yeah, saying you know, this, is a, this is a true story, but I better explain what I mean by true. I use the word true as we storytellers do, um, the way my old teacher Lenny did when he told some story about a. 67 Mustang, a golden retriever he'd once had. And I said, is that a true story? And he said, what the hell do you mean by true? You want to know if it happened word for word? Like I said, it doesn't matter. There's all yeah. kinds of things that happen in life that just aren't true. The question is not whether a story is true, but whether it has truth in it. Truth with yeah. a capital T. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I had Lenny do a disclaimer, which kind of accounts for Lenny. Yeah. It's brilliant story, and and also I got to mention it's not just a biography; it's it's uh, peppered with folk tales as well. Um, that that preface or conclude certain sections, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, there was only you know that I, as I looked by it, these were the stories that helped me get through. And oddly, those were easy to write. The Beggar King, which frames it, that story of King mm-hmm. Solomon from beginning and end, and the chapter opening stories, those just came naturally. The rest of the book was a pain in the ass to write. <laughs> it, I, I don't know. This writing business is like really difficult. And and, yeah. and it would be, you know, because I, I wrote it, I began writing it in the time as my voice came back. But it took five years of writing and, and rewriting 
to really find the right voice for the book. Right, and I, like imagine I, that your, I imagine yeah. that your lens uh, of the sickness and the process also changed and refocused as time progressed as well, I imagine. Yeah, the, the perspective is, um, yeah. is you know, always the, the challenge. I was telling stories about Nas, Nasruddin recently, or Nasruddin, or Nasruddin, Hoja, Johad, Nasruddin, yeah. I mean, it's known by more names. But, um, and I was explaining to this group that if you were to go to Turkey, you'd see a statue of, of Nasruddin, or the Hoja, Joha, and he would be a seated atop a donkey. And you know it's him because the donkey's facing forward and he's looking backwards. And yeah. I said, with Nasruddin, you never quite know where the wisdom ends and the foolishness begins because this could be a beautiful, brilliant answer to one of life's great mysteries, which is life must, must be lived going forward, but can only be understood looking backwards. Yeah. Oh that, or maybe, maybe yeah. it's just a way of saying... Nasruddin is such an idiot. Everything he does is ass backwards. <laughs> Both are true, but it, but it's it's also truth, right? I mean, there's that one wonderful story where he's sitting underneath a tree, and there are these two travelers. The first traveler comes up from the east, and he says, "What's the town like that I'm heading towards?" And he says, "Well, what was the town like that you just came from?" And he says, oh, "It's terrible. People are so rude there." And he says, "Yeah, the next town's terrible as well. They're all the same." And another guy comes from the east on the same road. And he asks the Hodge the same question. The Hodge says, well, what was the last town you were in? Like, oh, the people were wonderful. He's like, yeah, the next town, the people are going to be wonderful too. Right? And, it's, <laughs> and it's like, is he lying? Or is he, or is he bringing your truth to it with a capital T, right? Is he saying that it's your point of view? It's like what you bring to that town, right? It's what you brought to that last town, right? And it's, mm. it's like, those are the truths that I like in, in folk and fairy tales. That's what's so rich. And, and just because of Nazrudin, it's bad luck not to do at least three of them i think well, we've done I, I, two right <laughs> yeah so here, here's another one and you know this one came i just learned this recently i love it and i have to i have to give it away the um this was in i was with liz where you know liz i was um i was yeah. doing a workshop at her barn up in bellamina up in the northern ireland and this woman showed up a storyteller a turkish storyteller from dublin but she's from turkey and lives in dublin now and she she um she had a copy of my book in Turkish for me to sign, which was really sweet because um, in all these languages now, and I can't even find my name on the cover in some of them. But <laughs> That's so cool. She said, she said, I have to give you a Nazrudin story. I said, all right, all right. Um, Sanim, I think, was her name. And I, I said, uh, she said, Nazrudin loved his donkey more than most anything. And yet one day he looked out and the donkey was just, gone no sign of it he ran around the town in a panic looking there's got to be somewhere somewhere there's donkey donkey no he asked everybody no sign of his donkey and in an abject panic he ran around not knowing what to do and and he uh he finally came with a plan he would make up a big sign so he just went to the center of town made a big big piece of paper and he he drew a picture of his donkey on the piece of paper and on the top he wrote missing donkey reward big letters he thought for a moment and he said, missing donkey, reward. Whoever finds my donkey can keep it. And people said, Nazrudin, that's crazy. That's your reward. You're, you're giving your donkey away. You love your donkey more than life itself. He says, that's true. But in life, I've learned two things. One. We must find what we love and two we must be ready to give it away oh. So oh, 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 oh. share that story i will i love that story that's such a good story one of my one of the things that i've told my kids over the years you know learned from personal experience is um if, if there's something that you have that you don't want to lose don't lend it to anybody but if it's something that you love, give it away because you can always get another whatever it is back, right? Mm -hmm. I used to do that. There are certain books that I used to I used to have that I absolutely loved, and I would buy you know like three or four copies of them. This is this is before I realized that you know books aren't cheap, <laughs> <laughs> and I'd leave them on trains or in cafes, 
I'll have a little note in here and say, you know, pass this on to somebody that you think might like it. And let's make a list of the, you know, here's my name, put your name underneath it and then hand it on to someone else. Mm. Yeah, I don't know where those books are. And then when I when I went to, uh, I, was, I was talking to someone that worked in an airport and they said that they have rooms filled with books that people have left. So I never leave a book in an airport because they just sweep them away. <laughs> wow. I had yeah. no idea, but of course. Yeah. Yeah. They have, yeah. And all sorts of other lost property too. And it's like, well, why don't they give them away to, you know, refugees Brilliant. who are coming into the country or whatever, you know, or like, yeah. you know, under underserved communities of any sort, you know, but uh, yeah, apparently airports are huge <laughs> depositories of used books. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? But, but it goes to sort of, I mean, anything ties back to storytelling one way or another, but it goes to sort of one of the, the reasons we tell stories is to make something precious and meaningful that, that, you know, you, th you, you picture some, you know, I think of Dallas Fort Worth airport and, and the, the vast number of books they have that they're sitting around there, yeah. but with the right framing, and the right story, then something becomes truly meaningful. I'm teaching a class now through a group called Stage Bridge, which is a senior performing arts center, senior being like over 50. You know, that's a, that's a new senior. And um, that's me. <laughs> and, and, and this is, it's, it's called um, Stories Sparked by Our Possessions. And I'll be, I'll be teaching like this it. afternoon. The I focus like is on, today is on stories because today's the Ides of March when we're talking. Tomorrow yeah. is Purim, the okay. Jewish holiday of Purim, which yeah. is where my story began when I woke up on Purim with gout, which led to the, the finding of my my uh, the thyroid cancer. And then the next day is uh, St. Patrick's Day. So the focus is on luck and lucky objects and unlucky objects, but it's the stories associated with things. And this to me is one of the great gifts we offer as a storyteller is in a world with way, way too much stuff yeah. and too many activities and too much news and too much information so that we're just overwhelmed. Yeah. Storytelling yeah, kind of carves out a space for you to look and say, ah, look at this. And it's so funny because it's, it's almost the exact opposite of what storytelling used to be, or what I, I thought of it as. My 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 object, my, my sort of ideal, having a childhood, you know, where we would we would sort of try to cut through the smog and try to fry an egg on the sidewalk, but you couldn't because <laughs> by the time we opened it was already hard boiled, it was that hot, blah 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 blah. <laughs> my my notion of storytelling was um more like more like a circus coming to town like yeah everything's pretty much same old same old in this little town somewhere but you know one day the circus comes to town and isn't that magical and yeah. that, you know that that was my first i mean i mean i told you when i started storytelling but really as a kid i was doing puppetry but you know as a at age four or five and the idea of bringing these creatures to life and then i, I eventually started a career as a magician and to work my way through high school and into college doing magic shows. So you were, you were paying for college with magic shows? I paid for some of it, but but you That's can't so pay cool. for Stanford with magic shows. No, Stanford, was, Stanford was very <laughs> generous and, and well-endowed and gave me, and my family had no money for college at all, um, especially after my brothers used whatever there was left in the in the bank account that was gone my parents said here's a hundred dollars that's your college education good luck and uh wow and but stanford was really very generous in in supporting me even after i dropped out and and you know then decided to come in back and study storytelling um but that was but, but magic was always a kind of a an extra side side gig for me and a way to Just earn money for my family like when i was in high school uh -huh. I earned money for my family because we we didn't have you know, my parents were on my my father was usually sick or on welfare or disability, and it was it was you know money was short. Wow, do you still do magic? I do a little bit, you know. After um, after 
dreidels on the brain, uh-huh. which is very much about about doing magic over the eight nights of Hanukkah and then looking for a miracle. And the time when my father was sick and in the hospital, it set over eight days of Hanukkah, 1971. And we're working on a musical based on the book, which is really kind of fun because it's such a fun, wild era. I started to get out and do some some things. This, this is going to be a big hit here. I, <laughs> so Joel, Joel is making a... Hang on, let me make you full screen so I can actually see what you're doing. <laughs> At this particular point in the podcast... Joel Ben Izzy decided to take a pencil, a long straight pencil, and rub it up and down, and then wobble it in his loose fingers. This presented the optical illusion of the pencil bending. <laughs> As Joel said, this is really good stuff for a podcast. <laughs> the screen's exactly the opposite. Or even taking a, uh, taking a pen like this uh-huh. and rubbing it. I wonder if that really works. It does. Yeah, it does a little bit. Yeah. So I, I haven't done magic as much recently. You know, what <laughs> happened was over over time doing magic, I became, uh, I guess you have to say, disillusioned, which is, is it felt like it was mostly about tricks and props and me knowing a secret that you don't know. So there was that inherent distance. Like, oh, I'm smarter than you are. I'm the magician. And and it began to feel false. And when I when I started telling stories, I thought this is in a way very transparent and you're giving something to somebody that, that can elevate them. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I've I've seen some very good mag, uh, mag, magicians um over the years. I think probably because I go to a lot of showcases. <laughs> Uh huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> but there was a guy when we used to live up in um, Orford, New Hampshire. We used to go up to Bradford, Vermont, and there was um, a restaurant there, and they would have Marco the magician who would come in and would do these. I, I don't know if they still do, but he would come in and do table magic. Mm-hmm. And there was a trick that he did for us once, and and we were just like blown away by it because it was like basically give me a wedding ring and I'm going to do this trick, and he, you know. One minute it's in this dollar bill and then it's gone. Uh-huh. And then he then he pulls out his his keychain wallet. It's a wallet you open up and there's a, there's like keys on little hooky things, and on one of the little hooky things is is the wedding ring, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just like, what? How on earth can you do that? And the next time we went, he did it. We asked him to do that trick because it was just so mind blowing, you know. And it's for me that there was an excitement there that he was giving us this this thrill. Uh, of the unknown mm-hmm. and and i don't know maybe because i just love magic with a ck and the magic yeah. stories right that 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 whole mystical place of you know the the mysticism if you will uh, mm-hmm. of life right and i think that that type of stuff plays into that so i have this ma- massive appreciation for it but i i totally hear what you say and i really believe that you know what you're saying is true about folk and fairy stories is that they are they they give something to people and they elevate them and you know it because you can see those people in the audience who are just sitting there because they have to be right because either their husband or their wife has dragged them or their parents have dragged them right and they don't want to be there and they're sitting there but then you like you, you hit a story which resonates with them and you can see the corners of their mouth starting to turn up and they're like no i'm not gonna no. And then they start to smile a little bit more and all of a sudden they're leaning into you and they're, you've, you've got them then, or the story's got them, right? That's, that, that, that it's such, I mean, this is, this is kind of the great joy of being a storyteller yeah. is what you're staring at is people's faces. Yeah. And, and they say conductors live a long time, you know, because they're, you know, they're conducting and, and just the music and the, the heart, and that's, that's a reason, but, but there's something so so delicious about seeing a story appear on someone's face. Yeah. And I, I've done a lot of um, story consulting in my time. I mean, so okay. you know, it's just, I have never had a job. Um, <laughs> so I was, and I was going to ask you for one time because I could be, really, I've, I've never had a job. But if, well, um, we've already, we were going to start in business together, right? The irony. Yeah. Humor, I think I need something with a paycheck. Have you heard of this thing, a paycheck? 
It's like no. the idea that I'm a storyteller, I'm a performing artist. <laughs> yeah. So, and you know, to, to, to live in Berkeley is not cheap and we have a big old house and, you know, it just goes on and on and on. But, um, but I, I, what I, so what I did, and it's really been almost, it's been 30 years now is um, I, I was invited to sit on a, a jury um to it was it was a, it was a trial a mock trial training jury and I, I watched these lawyers who were training practicing their skills ah oh. and and they I, I realized that they were terrible they were snide <laughs> oh so you asked the shipment be done in the usual way huh? you know they they were they were snide and and one guy came up to like build rapport with me and you know to like they talk to you hey it's a nice tie which was weird because I wasn't wearing a tie. So it was really, it felt like a total miss. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mentioned this to my brother-in-law who was a lawyer at the time at, at one of these big fancy, fancy LA law firms. This was a firm of somebody, somebody, and somebody else, you know, in, in, <laughs> in California. And this is the glory days of, of law firms when like they were late, they were as rich as tech is now. And was so, it something like Dewey? Dewey it- Cheatham and how? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, this no, this was this was somebody somebody and somebody else. And so <laughs> so I mentioned this to him and a couple months later he called and said, "You know, we are having a retreat in Santa Barbara for our law firm and they we're going to have a workshop on uh on yoga for lawyers, but the yoga instructor threw his back out. So maybe you want to do storytelling for lawyers." That's and the I irony started, again. I, yeah, there we go. So wholesale irony. Brooks and Ben Izzy. Should we do it? Should we do it? Simon and Joel. No. Simon Simon sells. No. So so we so I went I went to do it and I told that story you heard of the coin in King Solomon. And afterwards a fellow came up to um to introduce himself to me. And this was the firm somebody, somebody, and somebody else. This was the somebody else. And I looked at him and I said, Whoa, you're alive? Because I thought if your name was at the top of law firm, you'd been dead for 150 years. He said, <laughs> I'm alive now, but I'm not sure about next week. I said, what happens next week? He says, well, I got a case going to trial. And what it involves is me conveying the contents of about 16 feet worth of depositions to 12 people who couldn't figure out how to get out of jury duty. Oh. And there was a lot I could have said about that, but what I said was, you measure depositions in feet? <laughs> he said, yeah. And in fact, they're four to a page. So 16 feet is actually 64 feet. Wow. I said, wow, that's a lot. He said, yeah. And the thing is, I don't quite know what this case is about. I like don't understand it either. And I can't explain it to them until I understand it. And I said, you haven't got much money writing on this, have you? He said, well, our, our clients do, like $50 million. And at the time, $50 million was a lot of money, right? So um, it's still a lot of money to me. I, I go, to I, me. I, I, <laughs> so, so he said, look, why don't you come back to my office in Los Angeles? We'll, you'll, you can help me sort of think about this as a story. And maybe even at the end, in closing, if I could, I could borrow your King Solomon and the Coins story. So we went back to him and back to his office, which had enough, sure enough, all these these depositions stacked against the wall. And I said, so what's the story? He said, well, the plaintiff alleges that on March 3rd, 1982, three-hour information dump. And I said, wow, that's not a story. That's a lot of information. <laughs> I said, but there was something funny in that story. They, there was, this was about a merger that was supposed to happen that didn't happen. They had code names. Yeah. There was the wolf was one. One was the bear. I said, that's kind of interesting. He said, yeah, I never thought about it. It was like the big bad wolf who's knocking at the door. You know, he began to, to play with oh. this. And I said, what did your, tell me about your client and how they began and what they wanted. And, you know, and as I listened to it, I thought, well, this is one of those gray areas. It's not like I'm supporting some bad guys here. This is a kind of a gray area between giant companies. And, after talking to him, I said, is it like this, this, and this? He said, no, but it's kind of like this, this, and this. And it began to shape into a story. And you could see the excitement on his face. He said, oh, I, I want to tell this to the jury because what I want to explain is this part. And suddenly he had the framework to fit into this. And, and he was excited about his story. 
which we shaped up into his opening. And then he, he won his case. He saved his client $50 million. And I was getting called by all sorts of lawyers who wanted to win their cases too, which is what lawyers want to do, which was great. <laughs> Because they bang you, I hope. They were, I was charging them what they charge their clients because otherwise they wouldn't respect it and I yeah. could use the money. And the good news was I was getting a lot of work from lawyers. The bad news was I was working with a lot of lawyers. <laughs> totally get that. So, but eventually I, th this led to other kinds of story consulting and some of it's been actually really wonderful. Some of it's been great. It led so to some yeah. So there's, there's a question that I often ask people on this show is like, what's the most unusual job? And that sounds like, or unexpected, uh, at least. Mm -hmm. That sounds quite an unexpected thing to, to be in, you know, consulting for lawyers as a storyteller. That was unexpected, yeah. I mean, consulting for lawyers, speakers, organizations. I mean, I'm thinking of, of places I've performed. I was once hired in the elevator at Macy's to tell stories between the first and the seventh floor up, down, it's short stories, up and down, up and down. Are you, are you serious? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was it a very slow elevator? <laughs> well, it, it got slower because I would sort of push pause and it, it, I, they, they weren't very happy with it. But I ended up in all these places in like an amphitheater in Italy where I could speak in a normal volume and the acoustics were such, this was like the, oh. the far east side, the acoustics were such that I could speak like this and they could hear like 50 yards away. It was wonderful. Yeah, the Hollywood Bowl is like that, isn't it? It's, you know, I've never been on the stage and I know that they have all these, I mean, I, I, I've never told any to perform there, but they have these large structures that echo and correct the sound. Yeah, we, when, when Sarah and I, we drove, you know, she's from the East Coast and we went out to Portland, like I said, when we drove cross country, we ended up going to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I, one of the things I wanted to do was go to the Hollywood Bowl because the Beatles had played on it, right? And oh, yeah. Like anywhere that John Lennon, Paul McCartney and Ringo and George had been, I, you know, if I was going to stand on that stage, that was going to be it. And uh, sh Sarah was out on like the back of the audience place. And I, I don't know if I was allowed to be on there, but I climbed up on there anyway. And I was just talking in my normal voice. And I was like, can you hear me? And she's like, yes. And I was like, imagine playing with 60 watt speakers, right? Which at the time were probably like the biggest speakers you could get mm -hmm. with this whole place filled with screaming people. And it's like, uh, would, do you think you'd be able to hear? And it was like, absolutely not. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I remember in high school, like I, I, I'd asked a girl out on a date. Her name was Lisa McPherson. Very sweet. And um, I had a date and almost no money. And I asked Mr. Zegers, who was the cool young teacher. I said, what do I do? I have like not much money. He said, how much you got? I said, I have like $15. He said, okay, here's what you do. Can you get your parents' car? I said, yeah. He said, you go to the Hollywood Bowl. I said, I can afford the Hollywood Bowl. He said, no. They have student tickets that are going to be $3 each. And then what you do is you go to the store and you buy some bread, some cheese, and some chicken, and then a bottle of wine. Don't tell them I told you to buy a bottle of wine. Use a fake ID. <laughs> and then you go to the Hollywood Bowl, and that's going to cost you like like 10 or $11 for the food. Maybe like $8 you can get that. Then you go to the Hollywood Bowl, but you get there like an hour and a half early, and they'll sell you the best seats. And you, you sit there in the Hollywood Bowl, as the stars come out, you have your bread and your cheese and your chicken and your wine, and you sit there, and she'll be so impressed, it'll cost you $15 total. I said, that's great. And so I go there, and sure enough, exactly as predicted, I sit in there, tickets are $3 each, best seats available, like right in the center, the stars are coming out, empty except for right in front of me is I see another couple seated and I look over their shoulder and there's like bread and cheese and wine <laughs> and I look and I say Mr. Zegers <laughs> he said yeah you know I was describing this to you and it sounded like like such a good idea I had to do it myself <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's so cool <laughs> 
yeah we did we were just we were just passing through we didn't we didn't we didn't get to eat anything or spend the rest of the day there but it was it was amazing being on that's i love that stuff. that's so cool. yeah. what a romantic time yeah what a romantic time it so what, what i want to ask you something a little bit about your process when you come to learning a story um mm -hmm. you've had a chance to interview all these storytellers i would love to interview you for your podcast because now I got to hear the story of the parrot and the merchant. Oh, I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to do it for you. Yeah, but but, so. I, but but I, but seriously, I would be happy to interview you, and turn the mic around the other way. Um, you'd have to record it because you got the setup there. But then and then you could be um, you could be interviewed on you. Has any have any of the storytellers interviewed you yet? I, I, somebody tried to do it once, and it just it wasn't very good. So, uh huh. <laughs> I don't find myself that interesting. So. You know, they were asking questions, and I was like, "Yeah, well, what about you?" You know, like we kind that's, of like that's, back around. That's the old storytellers thing. I don't find myself that interesting. You well, know, that's, I remember... why I tell, that's why I tell folk and fairy tales and not personal narrative. It's like I don't want to share that stuff. Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> funny. I remember, I remember doing a workshop at a school in San Francisco years ago, and I, I don't know. I think I'd copied off some of Aesop's fables when teaching people to move around like this, and you know bring these stories to life. I mean, that, that kind of workshop and, mm -hmm. and getting the teachers involved. So they tell stories to their students. And, and afterwards, a young African-American teacher came to me and said, well, this is great, but I, I just couldn't tell stories like you do. I just don't have stories. You know, they're not interesting. I said, nothing. And she said, well, no, not these, these kinds. She said, but you know, there were the stories that my grandmother told me about escaping on the underground railroad mm. when she was a little girl. You think my class would find those stories interesting? And I said, "Yeah." So the idea that, that, that I mean, yeah. this, this is something I, I confront all the time: is that people, and you know, in in my experience, in the right context, in the right setting, everybody becomes a great storyteller, and people's stories are are really very interesting. Yeah. And I think this might be some of what you were talking with Jay about that sort of that English notion of, and I have run into this in Ireland too, where I've, I've done workshops and help people find their own stories, but they, and then, then they tell these marvelous, beautiful stories from the troubles and other things. They said, but mm. nobody would pay me to tell these. I wouldn't, I would never do that. But there is, right. it, it's something strangely, you know, and it's Americans go to the, the other extreme where we say oh this horrible thing happened let me tell you about it about this pus-filled situation <laughs> and, yes. I, and i hear these stories thinking oh god if this goes on 50 minutes you're gonna get a bill from me because <laughs> this is not story. i mean i i have yeah i love personal stories but they're but but they're, we're in an era of so many of them flying at you and really i i to, to be treated as a therapist without the, the tools is, is just harsh. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree with you. So, Joel. Yes. What's your process when you find a story that you want to – how do you find a story? It's a good question. You know, I mean, you've traveled a lot around this country. You know there are road signs, mm -hmm. and some say slow children at play. Yeah. And whenever we would drive those past those, my mother would always say, can't those children play any faster? And then there's the other sign that says soft shoulder. Yeah. And I asked my dad when I was a kid, I said, well, what's that mean? Anyways, he said that the California Highway Department puts that up. It's great. They realize people have too much tension in their shoulders and they should, they should soften <laughs> their shoulders. So that soft shoulder is important because it's, it's sort of trying to feel a story tapping me on the shoulder. And what I found is that my process is... I mean, I heard you interview Jay, who works so devoted and studiously to develop oh, yeah. this. And I so admire that. Mine is to sort of keep polishing it through telling. So maybe I'll tell about a story. It'll work its way into another story. It'll be a little reference point to a piece that sort of grows. And it, it's just shaping. I, I can't, I somehow can't really do it alone very well. And I need to work huh. with an audience on it and so I, I it's 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 an odd thing i sometimes wish i could i mean writing i can do alone and rewriting for a book but it's such a different different skill so 
it's really trying to get that story to take root and and plant it and then let it grow and grow and over time it just seems to take on a life of its own that said i'm at a strange point in storytelling which has always felt like a path for me and i don't quite see where the next space is it's kind of having faith that that path will appear yeah. i've written a couple books i'm working on on um another couple different book projects and we're going to musical but the path of story i'm trying to understand where it goes and and this past week i've been doing a lot of work on mindfulness and meditation at this at this retreat i went to in, in mexico mm. and there's something about the stories that heal us that bring us into the present moment and that that let us pay attention that seems like it's it's a very important work to do especially in a world that feels so chaotic and sometimes random and frenetic the stories that they focus us on what's really important compassion paying attention kindness so that's not a very clear answer. I guess I guess the straight on. I said I'd be honest. You asked what my process is. I don't know. I know it sounded like a process to me. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds like you you have a a story that taps on your shoulder, and so you when you're at a gig, you might say, oh, "I just found this new story, and it's about this." And you, and then the next time you might do the same thing, but you'll embellish it a little bit more, and then the next time you start to tell the story and it just, it grows from there. That's, that's what I heard anyway. Yeah. Now, that's not a process that I've, I guess there are some stories that I've told or have ended up telling that have started like that, but that's not how I generally work. It's not how a lot of other stories tell, but then Bobby Norfolk, for example, mm -hmm. he does, he doesn't tell his stories out loud. He works on them in his head quietly. He doesn't even tell them to Sherry. Right. Uh -huh. Uh-huh working on the stories in his head and Cheryl will say, do you want to, you know, say them out loud? And he's like, no, until he gets up on the stage and then he, out it comes. It's like, Oh God. Yeah. I, I, that, that, that's <laughs> in the head of Zeus stuff that I can't yes. do. But I will yeah. I'll just give you an example. I went a while back to my cousin's wedding and I went with a particular question. Here, my, my cousin in Denver married somebody who'd converted to Judaism, so it was like full-on Hasidic. She was the lesbian, feminist, politically leftist woman. Mm -hmm. She married the Hasidic guy who'd converted to Judaism, and this was a wedding like straight out of Helm. People dressed in black hats, fur of 18th century Russia, and the dividing line between the... So, so and, 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 and the rabbi had a long beard like this down to his waist and like, like this, and he blessed them, and he did the sign of the Kohanim, which is the you know, the Spock sign, right? <laughs> okay. anyway, this is, this is the, the blessing. Spock, Leonard Nimoy got this because as a child, he looked up in temple and he saw the rabbi's blessing with with this sign. This, you know, the so, fingers parted like this. Okay. A statue in Boston, I, I understand, of, a, of Leonard Nimoy's hand, the tribute to him. So so I, I'd always been curious because he blessed him with the, the Spock the Vulcan sign, which, which he did. And I'd been curious because another rabbi had told me that he'd said, you know, the ability to do this, this blessing, this, this Spock blessing, this is genetic. I said, really? He said, yeah, because there's different, different groups with Judaism. There's the Kohanim, anybody named Cohen, I mentioned Leonard Cohen before, he would be a descendant of the Kohanim, the priestly class. People who are from that priestly class have an easier time doing this but people who are from the Levites or Israel, the sort of lower classes, which is me, um, they, they have a harder time doing this. And I, when I heard this, I didn't know if this rabbi was bullshitting me <laughs> or if there was some truth. Was, yeah, it's called the Kohen gene. So I was in Denver. I saw the Hasidic rabbi who looked like a Helm character with his coat and his beard. And I saw him bless the, bless the, the couple and, uh, I, and I was riding with him to the other location for the reception. I said, Rabbi, you can answer questions that's been bugging me. Huh? There's a, there's this thing you do, you know, like Leonard Nimoy. Did. Yes, the sign of the Kohanim, the blessing. I bless the couple. They should live and be well. Jean and Al should enjoy. They have many children. Blah, 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 blah. I said, yes, yes. Is that 
genetic. Because another rabbi told me it was genetic. And he said, absolutely not. Now, this is strange because you ask a rabbi a question, you do not expect a straight answer. You say, well, maybe this. <laughs> but the, Talmud, the Talmud actually says this. But Rabbi Gimliel had a good point. So I said, what do you mean absolutely not? Absolutely not. The ability to do this is not genetic. I said, how can you be so sure? I'll tell you. He said, you saw I blessed Arthur and Jean, the young couple. They should live and be well for many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll abide to 120 plus three months. Yes, yes. He said, I do it, no problem. But, and there's always a but if it's a Jewish like, but, he said, I happen to have a twin brother who's also a rabbi. He does all the things I do, all the blessings. But when it comes time to do the blessing of the Kohanim, he cannot do it to save his life. And he's developed a technique with his talus string, you know, the, the prayer shawl. He wraps the strings from his talus around his fingers and he pulls them. It's like a marionette. <laughs> That's what I know. So where's that story going? I don't know. That was just one of those things that, that came up there. But is it a process? I guess so. Maybe, maybe I don't understand my process as a way. Maybe it has a little bit of Magic with a C and magic with a CK. Yeah. yeah, there you go. I don't want to spoil it for you, so let's not say it's a process. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, Joel, I really appreciate you spending all this time with me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, obviously, people won't know that we had probably 15 minutes at the beginning just chatting and having a grand old time. It's like we're long lost brothers that have, have just met for the first time. It's we would say our, our mothers were brothers, is the old saying. Oh, is that, is that my little brothers? From Helm, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's been an absolute joy chatting with you, and um, we'll have to do this again sometime in some form or another. Thank you so much for having me here on, on your podcast, and thank you again for your podcast. I've, I've been loving – I do the same walk through my neighborhood each day through the hills, wow. and I've been listening to your podcasts and conversation. Thanks to all the other storytellers who've been sharing their, their stories and their processes – with you it's, it's just such a great thing you're doing yeah well thank you very much yeah i i, I think that's a good idea to give a shout out to all my previous guests as well um absolutely they're, they're, yeah. everyone has been very generous with their time well thanks that, very much that's the trademark of storytellers generosity like nazrud and find what you love then give it away it's a tough way yeah. to make a living yes. and selling irony still sounds like a pretty good business to me <laughs> i think <laughs> it is <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And stay well. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye bye. Neither of us wanted to end the conversation, as you can probably hear as we stumble our goodbyes. So many stories, so many asides, so much life and joy. Thanks, Joel. I can't wait to be in person with you. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, be sure to check out other episodes. And if you think I should interview a certain folk and fairy tale, myths and legends storyteller, one of our elders, then please send me an email. You can find me and my work on Facebook and on my website at Simon Brooks Storyteller and on Instagram, Simon M. Brooks. Diamond Scree? Yep, that's me, the English fella and storyteller. A shout out to Chris Jed for creating and recording and letting me use the wonderful music for my podcast. His band is called Blackpool Mecca. Check them out. They're really good. You can help keep this podcast alive and support my craft by becoming one of my patrons and paying anything from a dollar an episode that you enjoy to a regular monthly subscription. In return, you get extras, early release, and exclusive content on my work. www.patreon.com forward slash Simon Brooks. If you can't join my wonderful tribe of patrons, then help me out by doing something you can do. I would be very grateful if you could leave a review on Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, wherever you found this episode. It doesn't take long, and it helps not just me, but others find and enjoy this podcast. Thanks again for being here with me. I know that there are a lot of other places you could be, and I really appreciate it. Until next time, be healthy, be happy, and share the stories you love. Cheers. It's just a story. <laughs> <laughs>